just weeks before the end of the war, the Japanese submarine I-58 launched a spread of torpedoes that went into the side of the USS Indianapolis. And without anyone except the survivors in the water knowing that the ship had been lost. For five horrific days after the sinking, their numbers were cruelly diminished and when they were finally spotted and rescued, only 317 remained alive. The story of their survival is an unparalleled account of perseverance and courage and self-sacrifice and faith. Most of us have not had any testimony whatever about this ordeal at sea. Uh, it wasn't that we were proud, you know, uh, with pride in our heart or anything like that. We just didn't want to talk about it. Most veterans don't. And I think, as far as I'm concerned, it should be told. The story should be told and revealed. And I'm glad that this is a way of, of telling from the horse's mouth, I would say, what really happened out there in the water. I was 17 when I enlisted. I wanted to go, and the whole country had the same feeling, you know. Everybody was together, and we were fighting for our country. We didn't think about death when we enlisted. We weren't afraid about, oh, I might get hurt. We were glad to be out there, and when we weren't being shot at, we were having a good time. You know, as an 18-year-old boy, I, I volunteered for the Marine Corps, and patriotism was at the highest level. You know, we rationed everything. We, we cooperated uh, fully. Uh, everyone did. So right after Pearl Harbor, that's when I decided to go and go. I was 17, yeah. And I told my dad I was going in. He said, no, you can't. I said, yeah, I'm going to go in service. He said, well, OK. He had to sign for me, so he signed me. Tell me, put me on a bus, a Great Lake bus, and here I went. They asked me what branch of the service I wanted, and I said the US Navy, and they put me in the Navy. And I was 17, they had nice clothes to wear, and they even paid me $18 a month, you know, which was, to me, was great because I come from very poor surroundings. And I really loved the Navy, I really did. About an 18-year-old member for that ship. Of course, I was just out of boot camp, and then they ordered us aboard the Indianapolis, and that was amazing because the ship was so large, and here I was, an, an apprentice seaman, going aboard ship. I was 18, turned 18 in October. I was basically in awe because I couldn't believe they had anything that big. I thought it was the biggest thing I ever seen in my life. <laughs> so I looked at it like that. And I said, oh my God, old country boy out there, and farm boy. <laughs> He'd never seen a tractor that big. <laughs> First time I saw the ship, they took us down there about 9 o'clock at night. They didn't have any bucks or anything. So they just said, lay on the floor wherever you could, and in the morning we we're going to get I had been in the Navy maybe two and a half, three years. So I contacted my friend in the 12th Naval District, and he said, well, we can give you a heavy cruiser, the Indianapolis, flagship of the 5th Fleet, or we can put you, assign you to a destroyer. So in effect, I choose the ship that, uh, that I served on. And I was 20 years old. I was one of, I guess, 39 enlisted Marines. He enjoyed being on the Indianapolis. I was 18. I could never have asked for a better ship and better men. Having an admiral on the ship helped a lot. You got some perks that you didn't get if you were on any other ship. One day, all the power in the Navy and the Army came on the Indianapolis. Spruance. Nimitz, King, Halsey, said the night of the 50 stars. President Franklin Delano decided that not quick that he wanted for his ship of state. He went all over the world nearly on that ship. A lot of people have asked me what a farm boy was doing joining the Navy. I said, well, the truth is, on the telephone pole would be a big uh, banner saying, join the Navy and see the world. And then the next telephone pole, it have a girl in every port. <laughs> I said, that's for me. I'm going to join the Navy. We witnessed heroic.
was the matter's finest hour. I say to you, be proud to be an American. This is a great country. I love it. I fought for it. I earned the 10 battle stars. I started into the Navy when I was 16, and I saw all 10 battles. We had uh, 21 mats and liners loaded with Marines and Army personnel to go to Australia. So we escorted every one of them. After we left Australia, they took us up to Alaska. We were in the Bering Sea, and we had heavy winter gear. Yeah, it was terrible. We'd go over one wave and under two, and the ship was awash almost all the time. Oh, it was <laughs> cold as hell. <laughs> I froze to death up there. We had to go out and break the ice off of the lifelines. and We sunk a Japanese ammunition ship, and of course we bombarded uh, Atu, Kiska, and different Japanese uh, fort holes that they had up there. And we went completely from the cold weather down to the South Pacific and all the battles down in there. The first battle was at Tarawa, and I wasn't even 18 years old. They were nothing but a bunch of kids. I was 17. We left the Gilbert Isles and went to the Marshall Isles. And then from there, Saipan, Tinian, Guam, Sea Battle of the Philippine Sea, down at Palu. We went with the fleet in the first week of February 1945, about 30 miles off the coast of Japan, and the aircraft carriers carried the plane that went in, and they did bombing and strafing. Well, we stayed out to protect the ships. We went from there back to Iwo Jima and started bombarding again. We watched the guys trying to go ashore. This was one of the times when I was happy that I didn't make the Marines because my battle station at that time was at a position where I could see a lot of what was going on ashore. And I was seeing landing craft and Marines being blown out of the water and the water literally turning red with blood and it made me sick to my stomach. They put the landing crafts up on the beach and it was so ashes instead of sand and stuff. Some of them would just sink up in the ashes. Well, they were, they were just setting duck targets for the enemy. On the 23rd of February, I saw the flag raised in Mount Sarabachi. That means it's Alaska. Come on down, they're going to raise the flag. We were the command vessel, the fleet. So we were the closest vessel to the island. He ran and gave me the binoculars. And I remember turning around and telling him, I said, big deal, and gave him back a glass and walked away. And how did I know that it was going to be famous? We left there after they hadn't secured the island, but they had it pretty well under control. They went back to Okinawa. An old saying, you can't dig a, a foxhole aboard ship. Uh, and when you have kamikaze planes coming in at you, you know, if you don't knock them out of the air, they're going to hit you. We had already shot down, had credit for seven. And it's kind of fun. You can see those tracers sticking in those jet planes when they're trying to come in, and then they'd fall down. And boy, it wasn't any more fun whenever we got hit. We, oh, it scared, every time you'd hear one come over, you'd be scared. At Okinawa, there was an awful lot of kamikaze planes. Some days there was a hundred up there. You know, that was really a scary thing. It was the day before the invasion of Okinawa. We were shelling shore. And we happened to be at the tan line, or the picket line that particular day. It was early in the morning when the sun was just coming up. We just got done playing cribbage or something. We missed it. They come in right over the bow. And the plane came out of the sun that no one saw it. They just said, all men, many battles, many battles. My battle says it was right by my gun, loading five inch shells. I saw this plane. And it looked like it's coming right to me. And uh, there was one man, Texan Myers. And when he saw the plane, he started firing 20 millimeters. I happened to be Captain McVeigh's orderly the day that the uh, kamikaze hit. I stood right there and watched the captain come out full speed. He said, who is that trigger happy? And then he realized there was an airplane coming at us. We didn't know what had happened. We ran backwards to the back end of the chart house. The plane did not come straight in. It flared off a little bit and then came in through the after end of the ship. That thing hit the fantail, and we didn't have armor plating on, on the fantails. And the bomb that the plane carried went clear through the ship, all of the decks. It went down. It didn't hit nothing solid until it hit the drive shaft, and then it exploded, and it blew up underneath. And that caught all these guys in their bunks. I was eating beans that morning. 
and had breakfast. And then hit things, plastic things, went just like the grass in the lawnmower. I'll never forget beans. We had beans all over us. I slept, I couldn't walk. I got on my hands and knees and crawled out of the cafeteria out on the outside to see what was going on. It just went, everybody went nuts and didn't know what to do, really. I just went to the stairway and looked down there and seen all that water in there, people hollering in there, wanting to get out. Where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Because I was going to see if I could help them. I couldn't do it. All full of water. They got some of them out. Some of them got out of there. And they sealed the hatch off the rest of them. Just couldn't find them. They couldn't find out. The water was getting ready to come out on top on us, and they had, had to do it. Nine men killed, about 30 wounded. Six of them were in my division. Earl Prosai was my uncle. He was a bugler, and he was one of the people who was killed. When the suicide plane hit us, and Calvin Ball got killed, the guy I went aboard the ship with. So there's two of us buglers left, and we each took turns sounding taps because we had a funeral on the quarter day. Yeah, it was a regular ceremony. They had the chaplain who was aboard. The boxes were to hold the body bags, and then we took the body bags over and put them in the, the landing craft vehicle, and then took them over on the beach at Caramarito, this little bay. I pulled up in the LCVPs to take them off. They said, let us handle them. I said, get, off, get out of here because there's snipers on the island and we don't know where they're at, so get out. So we took off real quick. We pulled into Guam to get some spare parts, and there was several anchored ships, and one of them was Indianapolis. And he says, oh, they're heading back to the States. They're damaged. They're going to get repaired. We were at, a, I think, at a 17-degree list, all the way back from Okinawa to San Francisco. <laughs> so you couldn't hardly stand up. You couldn't hardly lay down. You couldn't hardly do very much. I think I was 19 about maybe 20. I remember going under the Golden Gate Bridge. And that was a wonderful sight. We know that the atomic bombs were responsible for the cessation of hostilities, but we paid a high price for delivery. From 30 days after Okinawa, when we went home, I said the war be over when we get back. We had 30 days to leave, and I made good use of that 30 days. My dad shook my hand, real firm look in his eye, and he said, I want you to go home, Dick. I said, well, Dad, the war's putting her over. Don't worry about it. He used up all my time traveling. And uh, I was home one day, and I'd go back. And Mom, I told Mom and Dad, I said, I don't know where I'll see you anymore or not. The last day I was home, my mother was sitting on the front porch. She said, oh, yeah, I know something's wrong. You don't act like yourself. And I said, well, I'm dreading going back this time. I I feel real bad about it. And she said, well, I wish I could go for you, but I can't. I wish I could go with you, but I can't. And she said, but we know who can. I said, yes, Mother, Jesus. We lived in Brooklyn, and there was a knock at the door. It was Father Conway who came, and he talked to my mother and my aunt giving them the news that their brother had died when a kamikaze struck the ship and they both wept. I remember that really well. But then he made them understand that Earl had given his life for our country. I am the son of Lieutenant Commander Earl Odell Henry Sr., who was the dentist on the USS Indianapolis. He came home uh, for six weeks. We have a photo of their having dinner at the Peabody Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee, and this was right before he left to go back to California. And then I was born one or two days after he left. We were married in December of 42, it was 22. He called me when he came into Mare Island, so I hurried up and spent two or three days on a train and got out there. My uncle, William Friend Emery, seaman first class, he enlisted, and with the help of my grandfather, who was commander of the Navy, uh, he got Billy on the Indianapolis. I was 20 when I went on board the Indianapolis. Of course, the main thing I had to do was to learn the ship so that I knew it better than the back of my hand. I was in medical school, and I chose the Navy. I went aboard the ship off of July, and I was a gunnery officer. I was the senior ensign aboard, so I was brand new sailing on a warship. And we were in dry dock at the time. They had just come back from Okinawa, got hit by the, the suicide plane, and they were under repair. At the Mare Island Navy Yard, I got to see the under parts of the ship before I got to see uh, the living quarters and the important part of the ship. That ship was 610 feet and 450 feet was all open on it. And I said, I never put that ship together. You know, in 30 days, 
That ship was back together and was ready to pull out. So they called us back, and the next day we took off. We were fixing to go back to the South Pacific. We moved out of dry dock into the bay with orders to proceed to Hunter's Point to pick up some cargo for delivery. There was a, a huge, huge crate brought on board. And I personally helped load and unload components of the atomic bomb. I was in charge of Marine Guard that guarded our components for the atomic bomb. We were guarded, everybody had to go around. A couple officers grabbed one of the sailors on the dock, had him bring this lead container aboard and take it to the Admiral's quarters, weld it to the deck, and gave the captain the orders that if anything happened to the ship, why that was to go in a lifeboat before anything else. Rumors started flying all over the place all kinds of stories. So they had a pool on that for gambling. Everybody was betting on what that, those crates contained. A lot of guys said it was Cadillac for MacArthur, whiskey for everybody to celebrate the end of the war when it happened. And the best scuttlebutt that I heard about this cargo that we were carrying was that we had 20,000 rolls of scented toilet paper for Douglas MacArthur. Of course, needless to say, nobody ever collected a nickel on that bet. Even if they said it was a atomic bomb, it wouldn't have impressed us much because that ship was loaded with bombs and ammunition all over. <laughs> Every place you looked, there was ammunition in that thing. We're standing ready in the bay off San Francisco. Second class gunners mate said, boy, look at that bridge good. A lot of us will never see it again. But we didn't know what was happening on the ship. Every time they would leave Hunter's Point, they would go out to Presidio, where you go under the Golden Gate and into the ocean. When the ship sailed, and run on out there and watch them really go out into the sea. Well, we did that that morning. As soon as they found out atomic bomb was successful at White Sands. That's why we left there in a hurry. And when we got out there, we waited and waited, and they didn't come. They had already gone because they were going at such speed. And we kept at full speed until we hit Pearl Harbor. That particular trip took 72 hours, which broke the record for surface ships traveling that distance. We averaged 29 and a half knots. So it still stands today for that type of ship. We went on to Tinian, where we dropped off the bomb. They didn't have a, a deep enough anchorage for us to get in to shore, so we anchored offshore and a barge came out. Part that was in the Admiral's quarters throughout the trip was taken off first. And on the cabin deck was uh, uh, two lead canisters about knee high and 18 inches in diameter. And when it was taken off, there was a lot of gold braid to receive it. There was more brass on the dock that day than I ever seen before. They took the crate and set it on the truck and away it went. After we delivered the bombs at Tinian, why, we went back by Guam and got some supplies. Orders were given to uh, Captain McVeigh to proceed to Leyte in the Philippines. I've said it many times, even the Navy manual states that the ship our size in enemy waters must have a destroyer escort, but we were denied it. And they told him, no, says, you don't need one. There are no enemy submarines in the area where you're going. So we proceeded without one. Of course, on the 30th of July, just after midnight, we were hit by two tor torpedoes from a submarine and sunk. 10,000 tons of steel disappeared from the face of the earth. The moon was out, but behind the clouds, it was pretty dark. We didn't have uh, surface radar, we had air radar. So we were always supposed to watch for is that submarine or submarines out there and everything, anything is unusual in the water. Midnight, you don't see things like that. You don't see a periscope in the water or anything like that. And uh, we did not know, but there was a Japanese submarine on the horizon. The moon came out for just that particular time. The Japanese sent six torpedoes at us at 12 o'clock at night. I stood up immediately and looked at my watch. It was exactly 10 minutes after uh, midnight. First torpedo cut the bow of the ship off. Immediately I knew that the ship was doomed because I could hear all the bulkheads breaking below. I was down in the head uh, towards the fantail where my sleeping quarters were and the ship got hit while I was in there. I just fell asleep and boom, and 
I jumped up and I knew there's something wrong and grabbed my blanket and boom again and, and I went sprawling. And, and then the second explosion, about as long as it took Hoshimoto to say fire one and two seconds later, you know, fire two. And whoom, up in the air I went. I was sleeping on the top of the desk in my office. The torpedo hit, knocked me off the desk. The explosion threw me up in the air, I don't know how many feet, 10, 15 maybe. And uh, when I came down, I came down, I seen this flame of smoke and fire coming up out of that hatch. And Sparks and things coming out of that forward boiler stack. When the second one hit the aviation gasoline, it was a lot of people who just burnt real bad. I heard this terrible, terrible screaming of men beneath me being burned alive. I think everybody that was there in that section where I was at got burnt. Then after maybe 30 seconds, a minute of the screaming, it, it seemed to cease. They had burned up. Dr. Haynes, he was there on the, the deck, and he's trying to take care of some of the burned guys. Many of the men came up badly burned. I don't think I had any hair. I think my eyelashes were gone. Really, I didn't have much time to do anything except give pain medicine. The ship is somewhat like a funnel moving forward. And, and all of that water, you know, is coming in and the bulkheads are breaking, and yet no word is coming to abandon ship. Well, uh, no word can be passed other than an oral word because all power, all communication, uh, all electricity, you know, it, that, that's out. Our phones were all dead. I couldn't, nobody could reach any, he couldn't reach the lookouts or the engine room. Everybody wanted to know what to do. The, Nobody knew what to do. There was all kinds of life jackets hanging around the deck of the, the ship. Asked my Marine lieutenant, you know, permission to, to cut those loose. And uh, his re reply was, not until we get word to abandon ship. Well, the ship is sinking from out, out from under us. They tried to put the blame on the captain about abandoning ship. They could have hollered to abandon ship and nobody would have heard it. I mean, it was just a chaos. Everybody was hollering, go get on the port side, get on the port side, tilt the ship, you know. I said, them guys are nuts. They ain't, this ship ain't gonna tilt, this ship's gonna sink. Well, some Navy sailor, he didn't wait to uh, hear word to abandon ship. He began to cut those big canvas bags, the life jackets down. Everybody was taking off, jumping up for the sights. There was a Marine captain that told us not to jump over. You're safe here, but not for me. The captain had come down from the navigational bridge and met, uh, I think it was Mr. Flynn, the second in command at the top of the ladder at the signal bridge. He went down the ladder and all of us that was on the bridge followed him. The ship was starting to roll by then and going down by the bow, it's like this way and, and down. The deck of the ship finally became perpendicular to the water. And those poor guys that were, were you know, they, that were hurt. They, there was just not much they could do. And we were just laying there, and that superstructure was just leaning, and he's just about to roll over. Captain said, pass the word to abandon ship. Well, all we could do is yell and scream, abandon ship, abandon ship. And so when he said abandon ship, I left him. <laughs> I left the captain. <laughs> One of the fellas that uh... His name was uh, Kerlick, George Kerlick, and George was taking a shower when the torpedoes hit. So he, he didn't bother to put on clothes or anything. He just went, got off the ship stark naked. <laughs> we kidded him on that and said, George, did you turn off the showers? <laughs> we were confronted by something we didn't know anything about. We were young kids and we had never understood or been told how to abandon the ship or how to survive in the water. The guys hiding on the ship were all killed. I says, go get us some life jacks. So he went and they come back in a few minutes and had one. So he gave me that one. I didn't ever see him again. I was scared to death. I just remembered my mother saying, we know who can go with you. So it prompted me to pray a little short prayer, said, Lord, help me. And when I did, I had a feeling of calm and well-being. Next thing I know, the ship's going right out from under me. All I did was just walk over the side of the ship and into the water. I didn't jump off the ship. The ship left me. 
I saw two or three hundred men in the water. And then I just run down the side, just going to, I run down the side and dove in. I tumbled about three different times before I hit the water. And when I hit the water, I was in oil. I opened my eyes under the water and I could see this big black spot. I thought the ship was coming down on top of me. And what it was was oil on the water. The fuel oil got in your eyes, just burnt your eyes and got in your throat. You start throwing up. And I hit the water and, and paddled away as far as I could and looked back and I did see the tail of the a fan tail of the ship go straight up. It was unbelievable, a ship that large doing what it was doing. The, there was guys still coming off. There was like ants on a stick, you know, they're still coming off the ship. I had been on board the ship for 13 days. I was high up around 50 or 60 feet. From there, I got off the ship. And it just seemed like forever for it. You started to go down, but when it started, you're timeless, motionless. And as that barrel went down, I went right up that barrel. And that was the last thing I touched on the USS Indianapolis. And the last I saw of the ship, the two propellers, there was two propellers or screws that were turning in the air as they disappeared. When I was in the water, I looked at my watch and it had stopped. But that thing had stopped at 20 minutes after. So only 10 minutes had elapsed. I lost my home. It was the beginning of five punishing, agonizing, torturous days and nights. My name is Atsuko Ida. I'm a granddaughter of Commander Hashimoto. And this is my mother, Sonoe Hashimoto Ida. And she's a daughter of Commander Hashimoto. He was a captain of a Japanese submarine. They call I-58. He found the big ship, USS Indian Forest. He sent the two torpedo without the suicide bomb, just a torpedo, and he hit, he sunk the USS Indian Forest. The ship disappeared, and I was all alone. I didn't see anybody, and I was in the middle of the Pacific, and I figured, well, I'd wake up in my bunk. This is all a nightmare. 400 went down with the Indianapolis, and 880 got out. They're in the water. And it was guys leaving the ship all the ways. And that 12 minutes in the ship traveled quite a ways. And that's why we got spread out. There were about six or seven different groups of us uh, just frightened all the time that the Japanese who sunk our ship would come and shoot at us in the water. There was a little hollering, a lot of hollering, talking, all kinds of guys together, trying to be heard. Talk and whatnot. So I said something. He said, is that you, Cox? And I said, is that you, Josie? And I looked in his face. It was, skin was peeling off his face. He's flash burning. It was chaos. Most of the badly wounded people died in the first eight hours. So, but there were a few who hung on for, for a while. What do we do, sir? What do we do, sir? Well, you know. This, being an officer, I didn't know what to do, really. I, I'd never been th through this before. And he said, do you have a jacket on? I said, no. I said, I, I have one, but it isn't blown up. And he said to me, will you hold on to me? And he said, blow it up. And then after that, I was fine. But I, to this day, I never knew who he was. And I sure wish I did, because he really helped me. I couldn't see. I was blind from the diesel oil. I didn't even know. He's, uh, I just popped up out of the water and he grabbed me and put me on his net with him. I looked around and, and I decided I got to get out of here. So I started swimming. I was not really afraid of the water. Uh, I was a fairly decent swimmer. I was a good swimmer. Probably if I could do anything well, it was swimming. A lot of them didn't know how to swim, which was sad. I never did know how to swim and the Navy never taught me how to swim. I learned how to swim. I learned how to keep a boat, and there was a life raft, two of them, right underneath it. And I realized how fortunate I was. I feel guilty even finding a life raft. I finally got in a raft, but these other ones that didn't have a raft, or these ones were by themselves. A lot of guys swim to the raft to get in, but there was no room for them. Well, where did that life raft come from? 
We didn't have any. Well, everybody was on their own, basically, the first uh, eight hours until until the next morning. There was no leadership. There was no way to apply it. You couldn't see anything. Uh, naturally, you know, you see a buddy out there, you join him, and after a little bit, then we uh, we began to kind of congregate, and there was about 80 of us in, in my group. We had two life rafts in our group that had floated off of the ship, and there were three cargo nets. It was like 20 foot square uh, with corks and rope, you know. So we got that and somebody come by with a raft and we tied to that and we started gathering up the guys. And those that couldn't get inside the floating nets tied themselves out to the edge. A number of officers were, were leading the effort uh, to get together. I was in this group with Captain Park, a Marine, and he had a, he had a Marine voice and, and he was a big help in getting everybody together and leading the effort. We made a circle of that line, and the men now gathered inside the circle, which kept us fairly well together. We had in our mind that Tuesday they'd, they'd be looking for us. We couldn't understand why we weren't rescued. Well, we all thought that they surely a ship like that got the SOS off. First class radioman, J.J. Moran, you know you sent a signal, right? And he said, yeah. Well, I said, how do you know that signal radiated from the antenna? Well, he said, Morgan, I have a meter there. He said, when that meter, he said, the meter won't go if there's nothing going through the wire. No, he said, that's, it went. Uh, we were told that a, a message did get off, so we figured, well, a couple hours, ships will be looking for us. We didn't figure we'd even have a night in the water. We figured somebody's going to be looking for us. We were due and they take off on Tuesday morning, and we figured, well, if we were not, didn't report, they would uh, start a search for us immediately. A day or two came, and another day or two came, and nobody looked. We'd see airplanes way up in the sky, and we'd kick water and yell, and of course, hey, we looked like little pinheads from up there. The biggest problem we had was not food, but water. The water come across your mind so many times. We had three ounces in the morning and three ounces in the afternoon. You know, so thirsty that your tongue begins to to swell in your mouth, and uh, and then you see a little cloud coming over, and you see that it's going to rain. It's raining, just a small cloud. But as it gets closer and closer, you see that it's raining, and you know you thank the Lord for the rain for just a little bit of water, and then uh, as it comes over, all you can catch it with basically is your mouth. But then you take your hands and you kind of cup your hands then to catch some of that water and you you get a little bit of water. We all got sunburned and had uh, salt water lesions in our joints and our arms and our legs. And Dr. Haynes was trying to do the best he could with nothing. When a man started going down or something, he tried to get his dog tied. Some guys were bleeding and so you kind of keep away from them because they figured it Blood would strike sharks. They found us. They uh, they basically circled us. There were plenty of sharks. So you could see them. The water was crystal clear. And you could look down in the clear water and see 20, 30 feet down. And here's all these sharks going around. Come right across your legs like that and everything. So I said, Jimmy, at night I didn't see any sharks. He says, Pete, you don't know what fear is. I was walking on their backs. They seemed to be gathering in schools and looking us over. The bigger sharks were just kind of, like you say, were kind of curious. We had one great big shark. Somebody named him Charlie. And Charlie would get excited when you had the spam and you'd throw the spam can in. And especially if you open up a can of spam, boy, oh, they'd go at it right after right the cheese, you know. All right, so we opened up a can of spam sitting on the edge of the, the raft, and he never got a bite out of that spam. And from then on, there was no stop. The sharks started coming at us. It took, I mean, fast. They would think the guys shoot them up. You know? First day, I, I think we lost maybe 20 that first day. The second day was was carnage uh, uh, all, all over. It's hundreds of, hundreds of sharks. You knew that a damn shark had hit somebody because of the blood curdling scream that they let out. Unlike anything you ever heard before in your life. 
You didn't know when they were going to attack or not. And I was within a closer than you and me. And a, sh a shark came up from the bottom and took that buddy. And he just went up and they covered me with water, took him, and I never saw him anymore. Two arm lengths. From here to that sh back of that chair, I seen that taken, yes. Basically, I think anybody who actually got in the way of a shark is gone. You had to stay in a group. If you was out there by yourself, the shark had you. I went swimming one day. I thought there was something out there. It looked like uh, one of these cans that had the rations in them. Something hit me in the back. I pushed on it. Half my skivvy shorts were gone. The only way that we could fight them off was to scream at the top of our voices. Like a cargo net, it had uh, kind of styrofoam things to keep it float. And there was about 15 sailors on this. And then all of a sudden, about 10 sharks hit it. There was nothing left. And the Tuesday night came, and we knew that they weren't coming. So the Indianapolis leaves Guam. It sends an ETA, estimated time of arrival, 1100 hours, 31 July. It doesn't make it. They figured that since we were a capital ship and we had the ability to change whatever plans we had, so they just removed us from the board. We simply took the name of the ship, Indianapolis, off the board. The guy coming the next watch figured it, it arrived. No one knew they were down. No one knew where it was. The third day seemed to be the day that was the hardest, and we lost the most men. And Father Conway, he run into these men, and they'd be burnt and dying, and he would try to comfort them and do what he could, and he exhausted himself completely. He became incoherent, and he died from exhaustion. A lot of them lost the will to live, even, I suppose, and would duck down their head to drink. They're filled with salt water. And then they they would go out of their out of their head and a lot of them had weapons like knives and all that they would be so crazy that they'd start fighting among themselves and killing one another. I never forget these guys when they'd come up and say, Well, we're going to go over to this island. They said, I see an island out there and I'm gonna to swim to it. You look at their eyes, they're, they're lost. You see people when they're they're out they're, or not there. And he would announce uh, maybe uh, what, he, what he thinks he sees and try to get others to go with him. And here he swims out uh, 25, 30 yards or so. And then, uh, then at that time, with his frailing around in the water, uh, you know, you'd hear that blood curling scream. It's went on and on, on and on, sitting there after I got in the raft, just looking, just all there was was water, water. Sharks, guys giving up, guys swimming away. The third night was was sheer hell. And we talked about when the sun was going down, and if they're not looking for us now, from Sunday night to Wednesday afternoon, they're not looking for us. They don't miss us. So us guys decided, well, hell, this is where we're going to die. I saw some great heroism, and I saw some great uh, fright, and I saw some uh, things that I would never want to talk about. Our fourth day, we feared the darkness. We could not survive another day, another night of darkness. Airplanes go over every day while we're out there. Every time we'd see a plane fly over, we were waving our hands and yelling. And then there on that uh, fourth day, uh, uh, I said, I hear a plane. And uh, he's, he likewise did well. His name was Chuck Gwynn. He was flying a PV-1. And at flying at 8,000 feet, he's going to come directly over us. And so what do you do? Well, we have renewed energy and, and strength and so on. And we begin to splash water. We begin to yell. We begin to pray everything. And, and seemingly, when he got to a point that had he gone any further, he would have gone over. But you know what he did? He made a dive. Lieutenant Gwynn made a dive down toward us. That, <laughs> that. When we saw that airplane, we, we knew we, we were going to make it then. 
most beautiful airplane you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> it was a minor miracle that the, uh, the aircraft that found us did find us. Maybe we were out 140, 50 miles from base. And the sun's a little bit higher in that particular sector. You're flying right in the sun. And that particular morning that I was flying, it was clearer. And when you're looking at a slick, calm ocean, it's just like looking into a mirror. He says, I was flying at 8,000 feet. I'm looking out forward about four miles. I'm looking out on the peripheral vision about two and a half mile each way. I'm looking at 20 square miles. And for me to see a man's head down there, six by eight inches, in an old gray Kapok life jacket, impossible. But somehow, in the providence of God, he saw us. And old Ken said, hey, Morgan, he said, is that a plane? Right down on the horizon was a little dark spot going back and forth. And all of a sudden, a little flash of light came off of that dark spot. I said, that's a plane, isn't it? We're having trouble with the little radio antenna that trails behind that aircraft. We had to trail a wire out about 125 to 150 feet, and it, it transmitted with CW, Morse code message. He said that he had gone to check the aerial. And there's the sun is setting there late in the afternoon. He sees the, the sun hitting the oil that's on our clothing. And he had no idea what it was. He said there was no report of any American ships lost. He thought it was a, a submarine down there. And as he comes down then ready, ready to fire, so to speak, as he comes down, then what does he see? He sees boys. The men on his plane went to parachute out and help them. If he didn't find us the fourth day, none of us would have been here. We call him our angel. Our angel. Our angel. To me, that's some indication that the Lord is saying, I'm still with you. You're still going to make it. And I was thinking, but by the grace of God, there go I, you know. He was proud, so proud, and he said he spotted the men. He wired back or radioed back to his base on Palelu to send out surface ships that would help us. And after that, Adrian Marks with the PBY came out. On the way back to Palelu, Lieutenant Adrian Marks flying a PBY, flew over going the opposite direction. So I called him on the phone, asked him what was up. He said uh, he was going to investigate a report that a number of uh, people had been seen in the water by one of the Ventura planes. And I said, make emergency flank speed. Minutes mean lives. And that's the second plane we saw. And Marks and his crew saw that they were scattered over a 25 square mile area. He and his crew took a vote to see if they were going to land to pick up survivors or if they were just to go back. The men back at the tunnel hatch who were dropping this gear reported to me that they were seeing men being eaten by sharks. And that really shook me. But he decided to ignore the standing orders that this plane was not to be landing on the open sea. Well, he disobeyed that because of the serious situation. He radioed all ships in the area his exact location and told them to come and pick up survivors. We had uh, this message came through our ship, USS Bassett, APD 73. So we were on patrol and we were ordered to uh, to the scene of the sinking, which was some 12 hours away. I'm not sure exactly, but uh, it was about noon. We were actually on patrol off of Peleliu. All of a sudden, they called for flank speed. With orders to proceed to an unknown location, uh, latitude and longitude for unknown objects in the water, we didn't know what we were going to see. I don't think they even knew on the bridge what was really there. We didn't even know what we was looking for. Adrian Marks made a perfect landing in eight to 12 foot swells of water. I saw the plane when they landed. Popped about every rivet in his plane. They would never be able to take off. He taxied around a long time and picked up the stragglers. About one, the first one on there. They give me a house of iron use. I pass out, went out. And it was at that particular point that Adrian Marks found out who these people were. And he kept circling and circling. 
We tried to get uh, the, the ones that were uh, closer to not surviving over to, uh, to that plane. You'd swim between the pontoon and the fuselage, and they'd throw you a line. Adrian made the circle. The crew members would pull him into the plane. I had this uh, pneumatic life jacket, and I had uh, a fellow on each side of me, and I was holding, holding their heads up uh, out of the water, and I kept hollering, how about us, how about us, or something. And these two guys reached down. One of them grabbed me by one arm. One guy grabbed me by the ar other arm and just slung me in the, in the plane. On the plane, we were just laying in there like fish. We were on the alert with all our, making our inspections and watching everything, but we were, it was pretty fast for the Doyle. And we kept that up for several hours. And I finally called up the engineering officer and said, how long are we gonna keep this flag speed up? And he said, we have an emergency. There's some ship sunk and there's a PBY in the water and he's calling for help. He's got guys all over the ship and he can't do anything. A PBY, I don't know normally how many men it would maybe hold, but uh, certainly not 56. And he says, uh, some of you fellas mind crawling out on the wing? So I crawled up out through the hatch and I crawled out way out on the end of the wing and another one followed me and another one, so. They put us all on there and took parachutes and tied us down. The PBY that landed in the water, uh, it cost, it, they saved some lives, but it cost about 50 lives. Because there's some people that tried to, to swim over to it and they couldn't make it. I was only a couple of 300 yards from him, but I just didn't feel like swimming that far. Yeah, my best buddy, he was with me and he decided he was gonna to swim to the plane, and he drowned. I just stopped and had to rest on my life jacket. I happened to glance down in the water, and there, there was this shark looking back at me. Oh, Lord, not now, not now. We were still losing people, you know. Uh, I think we lost them right up to last minute. After a while, we did see several planes, larger planes. B-17, B-29s, and, and other planes flying all over the place and uh, dropping uh, kegs of water and life rafts and everything. They had to be very careful that they didn't drop something on us. It took Dr. Haynes and me all afternoon to be able to read the directions of how to get these rubber rafts uh, inflated. We went over and got it. And Eight of us were able to get onto that raft. I had a hell of a time getting on that raft. They dropped some, some survival gear, some different planes. And myself and three other men thought we'd swim to this. And I was the only one that made it. Two of them, how bad shape they're, their heart stopped along the way. And the third one was taken by a shark. So for all these years, I would be kicking myself in the tail because we made that decision. If we stayed where we was at, maybe them other three men would have lived. We don't know that. They dropped some water kegs, but the water kegs were these small ones made out of wood. Well, when they hit the water, this just blew up. The seal's broken. We didn't get any of that water to drink. And it hit in front of me about five to six feet away. The bag split, the can came out towards me, and I grabbed for it and missed it, and I watched it sink. Then it got dark, and here up going into the clouds was a big, big around light. And we thought as angels had come. I seen the light from the door. And then I knew it was a good Just then we seen a, a small boat coming up. Coming from the horizon. So who can it be? I don't know. I hope it's not Japanese. First ship that came in was the USS Doyle. It was at midnight that the Doyle came to a sudden stop. They shined their 24-inch searchlights against the clouds. The spotlight was up in the air. We had the first light that I'd seen on topside in four years. <laughs> the hair kind of stood up in the back of my neck. This big light was going, and I thought, whoa. And he wasn't supposed to do that. It was That was really against regulations, but he did it. Captain Clater was afraid that if he don't show the light, that some of the guys that are barely hanging on won't, won't hang on. He says he's trying to save as many as he can. I saved that light, and that was really making you feel better, too. God, it makes you feel good. 
gave us real hope. The uh, boat came alongside of the, uh, the plane and took us uh, off and put us over on the Cecil Oil. They took me out plane, put me on a boat, took me on a ship, did me a bath, put me in bed. They know nothing about it. And after they had sunk the plane, they took off and went back to Peleliu. The second ship that came in that night was the USS Bassett. And I took the helm. It was about midnight when we uh, when we got there. And decided that we'd better keep the spotlight on or we, we weren't going to find anyone. And didn't want to hit anybody in the water, so we stopped the ship, which, as I remember, was dangerous. Thuriel was the, the captain at that time. I think he just had maybe, I'm not sure, but he just went all to pieces. I do remember there was some <laughs> some argument. Thuriel was a coward. He really was a coward. He was very defensive. He didn't want the lights on, didn't want to go in the area because of fear of Jap ships. He might have been worried about himself. <laughs> Two or three other officers, one on each side and one in the back, sent him to his quarters. The executive officer took his place and kept this thing going, getting these people out of the water. The driving force was to get these people out of the ocean. People said the heck with <laughs> any, with, with any danger. That, that was the attitude that everyone on board ship had. Five ships that we knew of started coming in to pick up the rescue work. Real heroes were the guys who uh, got in four LCVPs and uh, went into the water and picked up the survivors. All we see is clouds on the water, strange crowds. So we go to investigate the clouds, it's black bunker oil. Bunker oil, in order, that's what we burn. You have to heat it to transfer it. And it's thick, heavy tar glue on the surface. And we get to, in the boats to go out, look at this tar, and there are faces, round-headed faces, black hair, round eyes, white teeth, black. I mean, stone black, and it's midnight. When this landing craft off of the Bassett came up to our group, the guy that was in there had a pistol, you know and he took the pistol out. He said, who are you? And he says, identify yourselves. And they come back, still got fight in them, just like a dumbass officer asking dumbass questions. When they started swearing at us, we said, yeah, you're from Brooklyn, what's the team? Dodgers, oh yeah. We started yelling and hollering and so forth. And all of a sudden, the searchlight came right on us. and. Thank the Lord, we were finally picked up. And the first guy who was rescued was an ensign from the Indy. And they brought him up on the bridge. And I'm steering the ship. And the captain says to this poor soaking wet ensign, uh, who are you? <laughs> and what happened? It was the first time that anybody knew the USS Indianapolis had been sunk five days earlier. I had just come out of the engine room and they were moving them in and there was one kid they were helping into the, the thing and I said, what ship you off him? And he said, Indianapolis. So I said, yeah, well, we just saw the Indianapolis and was heading back to the States. I said, he must be wrong. It can't be the Indianapolis. And I got picked up by the bass that they come with this floodlight. I didn't know who the hell it was, but I was going to get on anyhow. <laughs> now I felt something behind me like water splashing. And I looked up there, there's a blasted ship right there, it's close to here across the street over there. And I said, oh my God, we're watching this one here, and this one here's coming up on us. Sitting there asleep uh, on the life raft, and there's a guy put his hand on my shoulder and says, Sailor, are you all right? And I says, I am now. So they pull up to me and they, they say, hey, Sailor, can you climb up this rope? And they had rope ladders, and I said, so, oh yeah. So I tried and I couldn't, so they jumped in the water and boosted me in the, the uh, Higgins boat. There was a couple in the water that needed help, and I was the only thing there. I, the only way I could help them was in the water. He jumped in the water, shark-infested water, because some of these guys were so weak that they could not, they could not get them into the boat. It could be you in that water. You want, you would like somebody to try to help you out. You know, we're not that old, that old season, and we're not undertakers, and we're not nurses, we're not doc we're not trained for this, but we're doing it. Well, it was a very difficult uh, assignment, picking these people out of the water. Some of them were 
if you grabbed them, you know, the flesh would start moving on their hands. Being in the water like that and then also being burnt, you know, your flesh is real tender, you know. He said, you pick up your skin, it just piled up like cordwood. Like one of them said, we're damn near pickled. Now, if you washed a car or did laundry one hour, two hours in the water, figure what your skin is like. Now put yourself in the water five, five days. And I'm in a boat trying to lift the guy out of the water, and I grab him by his arms, and I lift under his arms, I feel the flesh separate from the bone. And of course, he screams. I let go and grab the life jacket, and from then on in, I lift by the life jacket only. Some of them just didn't believe they were being rescued, so they had to drag him aboard the, uh, the LCVPs. Another guy said, me, shove off, Jack. We don't need you. It's five days in the water. They tried to pull one guy aboard, and he wouldn't come aboard. He said he was going home, and he jumped back into the water. I picked up a USS Bassett. I remember they had ladders over the side. Well, a rope ladder up the side of the ship, and I climbed on it, and they pulled me with that rope, got me up on board, and I thought, well, I could walk, and I got up and then fell down on my face. Put me in one of those baskets, you know, those, well, what a wild ride that was. The, the, <laughs> the Higgins went down and they jerked me up, and I thought, oh, Christ, I'm going in again. And they said, can you guys climb up the net? And I said, sure. I stood up, and that was the last thing I remembered until I woke up on the deck. Well, I was happy when they set my butt down on that on that side of that raft, I mean, that ship that was up there, I was happy. He and I both was grinning. <laughs> then we got picked up on Friday morning by the USS Talbot. And then they transferred us to a, another ship, and then they transferred us to another ship. So the APD Ringness 100 pulled up beside us. I was picked up by the Ringness. Well, he was captain was on the Ringness, too. Captain McVeigh was one of the first survivors being rescued out of the water onto our ship. He was one of the first we brought up, and the, he actually he didn't want no help, but he needed help after he got up there. And he says, I'm Captain Charles B. McVeigh, commanding officer of the USS Indianapolis. He wanted everybody taken care of before they looked at him. I do remember that for I was standing right there on the deck. I just remember getting on, he said, he's, he'd like to see the skipper. And he says, I would like for you to take me to you to your captain. Well, somebody took and taken him up to the wardroom with the captain, and the captain interviewed him up there. The first load of uh, survivors they were bringing back to the Bastet, three uh, survivors stood up too early. They went overboard, and uh, they weren't coming up, so I got lucky, and I was able to get one. And bringing him up, he entwined it with the uh, foot with, uh, with the second one. The third one, I don't know how he popped up, but uh, I had three there. That was the quota for the day, three. We all took turns going topside and staying in. And I saw plenty of sharks there. We were five knots is just barely moving and they would just lazily float around the ship. And they were, of course, I'm probably exaggerating, but they looked like they were 20 feet long at least. To see a man floating in the sea, upright in a life jacket, and then to find out that he has no legs, there's no lower body, he's been eaten by a shark, and to rescue this man. When you're 18, 19 years old and you're doing this, that's pretty tough. Yeah, they, they buried quite a few that were floating this, and he, but most of them had, the sharks had been feeding on them. Adrian Marks told me later, what, one of our reunions that they picked me up last because they thought I was dead in the life raft. They just picked up the guys off the plane first. A lot of times when you push them off, you wondered, uh, who are you out here playing God? Uh, this one you bring with you and you save, and that one you think is dead, so you, uh, it's not a good, it's not a good, no good experience at all. A Lieutenant J.G., a doctor aboard, and any person that wasn't on watch doing the things that had to be done at that time, he got everybody to turn to to help. And they treated us like the best nurses you've ever seen. They took diesel oil and cleaned us all up. On their hair and on their faces, we turned them upside down in a bucket 
of diesel. I remember this old boss said, we're going to need a bucket for this one. One guy came up a blonde, the first one we'd seen blonde all night. He said, we got, my God, if we got a blonde. They took good, real good care, good care. Yeah. Everyone participated. We had the crew and the officers. And Everybody played a role and did the best they could. We're one-on-one -on -one trying to get these guys washed clean. First diesel oil, then soap and water, and then we find some clean clothes for them. Cut their clothes off. You can't touch them. We just have to get them stark naked and cut them off. Some came aboard the ship with the bones of their toes showing. There were so many sores on, on most of these people, you couldn't tell whether they were sun-induced sores or sharks or bang-ups against, <laughs> against the, the rescue vessel or what. I mean, a lot of them didn't even look human. All the ones that uh, we had laid out on the deck, you know, they pulled a bunker off from the ship that went down. They were burned, they were shark bitten. You know, out of their mind, they thought they were dead. You know, they thought they were gonna die, all of them. I think I was as close to death as a person can be without uh, actually going the last step. We were just so damn close to death. That it's just, you know, one more puff of air, I think, about all we had. I'm glad that I got picked up tonight. Oh, I, I don't, I don't die. The Doyle picked us up, and we they picked up 96 survivors. I, so I understand that three of them died on the way to the hospital, and one died after we got there. They never got medical attention in time. I often wonder what those parents felt like. When they found out that their boy was saved but didn't make it. Three out of four men died. Either got killed or died in the water or eaten by sharks. We had about 200 as near as we could come, you know, uh, that were around there at the time. And, but they dwindled away over the days and until they got picked up. There were only 60 left in our group. Out of about 44 guys in our group, only 14 of us survived. We were down to about 10 men in our little group. There were 123 of us in our group. And when they picked us up, they said just in that general vicinity, kind of loose-knit group, there were 60. I want to join my shipmates. When I go out, I want to be cremated, and I want the Navy to spread my ashes where the ship is. After it's all over, you look and say, wow, what have I been through? Today, 60 years later, I still relive it. 317 half-dead survivors out of 1,197 officers and enlisted men. Yeah, I knew. I was either going home to heaven or I was going home back to Abernathy, Texas, and it didn't matter which because the Lord was with me. I felt that I would make it, and, and there are several things that happened, like the, the second day and the third day and the fourth day that gave me every assurance that uh, somehow, some way, that, uh, that I would make it. And how did I make it with nothing to eat, no water to drink, no sleep for five nights? Tell them the Lord was with me. If we had known they didn't know we were sunk, I think we'd all just given up in despair. But we had just had hope. Someone's coming. I never lost hope. We all had high hopes. We all prayed. I'll say that. We prayed and prayed, I suppose. That somebody was going to pick us up. Somehow I knew I was going to make it. I knew if I was going, if there was anybody going to make it, it was going to be me. Well, I thought if there's two picked up, I'd be one of them. I, I never <laughs> felt any other way. I never once thought about dying. You know, I was too young to think about who's going to die at 17 or 18 years old, you know. I wanted to live uh, as much as anybody else, and I wasn't brought up to, to give in and surrender very easily. Every time I was ready to give up, there was my dad's face right there. So I come home and I told him about it. He brought me home. And that's what kept me going and thinking about home. I finally found out the sharks didn't like Polish sausage. I'm Polish. That's why I was saved. Football coach always told me, he said, Buck, pretty good, but just do your job and don't don't try to do everybody else's job. When I got in that water, the first thing I thought about, my old football coach, when I got there, I kicked my shoes off, 
And all I'd done, man, was just lay there like a sold up pot. And I'll tell you one thing, you can live a long time laying on that deck, but not, don't ever move. You just knew everything was gonna be all right. And it was. In the water, we signaled every night, but we didn't get any answer. We, uh, so we thought we were the only ones that survived. But then we found out when we got to the hospital that was, uh, there was two other groups. One went to Palelu and one went to Samara. The Doyle took us to Palelu. The USS Bassett picked us up and carried us back to Fleet Hospital in 114, Samara in the Philippines. So they came in to the base area and then we went out there and saw what was going on. They were getting people ready to put them on a pontoon barge and they were in pretty bad condition. Then there's, there was no smiles on their faces. They were just serious, you know, trying to get away from where they had been for four or five days, you know. There were a few reporters around and uh, one of them took a picture of me. And this is the picture they took. It also explains why I have never tried to grow a beard. After Peleliu and dropped them all, we came back and we were part of the final search party. And we thought, sure, we'd find some more survivors. Daylight, but we didn't. They brought back, oh, probably a half a dozen bodies, but they were decomposing and it was hot and it was, it was daytime now. Hey, if you've never been around death, it's a terrible stench. And you, you, once you've been into it, you know what it is. So that's when the captain decided to give him a, a little ceremony and let him go down in the sea. The teenagers are out doing this. I'm 25, I'm an old man, and I'm directing them and guiding them. We were there for, I think, two or three days in the hospital, and they put us in landing barges, take us off to the hospital ship out in the harbor. We were transferred to the Tranquility, which is a hospital ship. And I went aboard it, discovered that it was air conditioning and had a nice white buck to crawl in. They put us on the hospital ship and sent us to Guam. Stayed in the hospital tomorrow, and I took my first airplane ride in my life. We were flown by on, put on DC-3s. We flew from the Philippines to Guam. At the base, 18 hospitals, so all the survivors ended up there. I know my corpsman and I had eight survivors. We stayed there almost a month in the hospital. We were under tight security. You know, we never got to talk to anybody but just our nurses and our foremen. We were encouraged to ride home, and of course it'd be censored. But ride home as if the ship was still alive, still afloat. Well, every letter, even our letters, ha had to be censored. If they mentioned Guam, if they mentioned Miss Sable, my nurse. Had troops around us because they didn't want anybody to know that we had been sunk. We were never allowed to tell the disaster until after it was announced. The local radio station there on Guam was, had the music playing, and all of a sudden they cut in on the music and announced the war was over. We had taken that bomb over and they dropped it, and Japan decided to surrender. On the day they dropped the bomb, the nurse came in with a picture of an atom bomb. That's the first time we knew what we was carrying. To some degree, I think you'd have to say there was a blessing in disguise that uh, that we uh, that we used the atomic bomb. Read reports from the Japanese command and what the orders were to stop our invasion. The government said that we have to fight. When at the school, they have some sort of stick, and they, we have practice stabbing something like that. But my goodness, if it wasn't that uh, bomb, uh, then dropped we're still fighting. Of course, they would fight to the last individual, man, woman, boy, and everyone. People that have lost their lives, both the Japanese and the Americans that would have lost their lives would have been astronomical. If the atomic bomb hadn't been dropped, we would have been in the first echelon of the landing at, uh, in, in Japan, and, and I, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. I think that saved a lot, lot of uh, people in Japan include me, probably. <laughs> a lot of times, a fellow will come up to me and say thanks, because uh, he was over there on the island practicing for the invasion of Japan. Truman made the right decision to drop an a bomb. So that second bomb, right after that, we heard war is ended. We was happy. 
Yeah. It ended the war. They brought the bomb, they dropped the bomb, and two weeks later, it was all over. We could go home. Back in the States, the headlines were the Japanese unconditionally surrender in small print on the front page. The USS Indianapolis sunk with 100% casualty, 317 survivors. When I got the wire on the 13th of August and that next night, the paper came out that the war had ended and everybody's just having a wonderful time. Everybody went downtown and they're screaming and hollering and so happy the war is over. And I was happy the war was over too, but you had the sadness in your heart, you know. I mean, I knew that he wasn't all right. Being over and hearing that my father uh, wasn't coming back, hearing that at the same time, uh, very painful. On VJ Day, I was notified my brother Thomas Leon Barksdale was missing in action and presumed lost at sea. My mother had a nervous breakdown, and uh, I was given a, uh, a leave. My mother had a hard time accepting that my father was dead. She thought he's a good swimmer. He might have made it to an island. But she didn't understand that, hey, there wasn't any, any hope of that. She called uh, Captain McVeigh's wife in search of, of information. She had talked to Captain McVeigh. Captain McVeigh had told her, don't give any of the family's encouragement. There's not any chance that if they're, they're missing, that they're going to be found uh, alive. They let us know without saying so that something terrible had happened. While we were in the hospital, there was an investigation set up in Guam. They had a board of inquiry, and I testified. Someone out of the Nimitz command in Guam, they uh, came down and interviewed us. Of course, I let them have both barrels. And they took us out of the hospital and put us at a, a submarine rest camp on the other side of the island. And man, they had gallons of ice cream on the table. They had steaks. They had everything and a good place to sleep. It's just like hog heaven. I'd never been anything like it. Admiral Spruins gave us uh, purple hearts. I got a purple heart, which I didn't think I deserved. And then they put us on the Hollandia aircraft carrier and uh, hauled us all home. Then we got close to the San Diego port and they made us put our dress blues on and we fussed and grabbed. But they gave us a ticker tape parade down through San Diego. My comment was, why are they parading us through here when all we have done is lose a ship? And they put us at Camp Pendleton and they didn't have room for us to sleep, so they turned us loose. And the SPs were picking us up because we were out of uniform. MP stopped me and he says, you in the Navy, buddy? And I said, yes, I am. He says, uh, well, he says, how come you're out of uniform? And I says, well, I said I was on the Indianapolis, and I said, this is all the clothing I have. Or well, like a bunch of ragtags. And... So they took me to the dispersing office. I got clothing. I got a ticket for on a train to get home. I got some money. <laughs> so it was fantastic. And then I went home. My mother and dad, they were tickled to death. You couldn't begin to give me a hug that my mother gave me that morning. I was on my way back to Tucson at that time. And all the headlines were about the captain being court-martialed and that they were bringing the commander that sunk us, but were bringing him in to testify against him. And that made a lot of people mad. It was in the paper, of course. It was, it was just a bad deal. They had him down for uh, two charges. They had him down first, failure to give proper abandoned ship orders. Yeah, you know, I testified at the court marshals. Primarily, they ordered to give the abandoned ship. They just too much evidence that he gave proper orders the best he could, and then they had him down for hazarding his ship. So they just stuck him on, not zigzagging. It was a mistake, and Hasimoto, the skipper of the I-58, said he couldn't escape me. He fired a spread of six torpedoes, and he did this precisely because he expected the Indianapolis to zigzag. That's exactly what that tactic 
is designed for. He said, even if we had zigzagged like we were supposed to have been doing, that there was no way that the, we could have got away from him. He always insists that was kind of easy target for him. That was not Captain McVeigh's fault. I think main question they asked was, did it matter the ship did zigzag to avoid torpedo or not? And he said, no, it didn't matter. It would have been harder. If it had moved, I might not have noticed it first. But eventually, I would have nosed the ship around to the right position in time. But interpreter translated different way, and he understood some English. So he said, no, you have to say like this. He started argue, but the interpreter didn't change his position. So looks like they already had an answer. My grandpa was a guinea pig, you know, just take him and say something to prove the Captain McVeigh's fault. But Admiral Nimitz didn't agree, right? The operational commander didn't agree. Um, and, is, and in the testimony that was given during the court martial, even the prosecution of witnesses didn't agree. So he had a he had a feeling of regret. And he said, it's, it's unjust. Don't do this to the man. Here's an enemy coming and, and protecting a sailor, a sailor protecting a sailor. Hashimoto stuck up for the captain. Even when we was trying to get the captain free, the Navy fought us all the ways. Did the Navy give him a raw deal? The man didn't deserve it. He was one swell guy. He was good. He was personable and uh, easy to talk to. His captain was a good fella. Real gentleman, uh, old school. He was always very generous, uh, I mean, courteous. Well, he was, he was tough. As the best captain I ever, ever had. I, By far, he was my favorite. I mean, he was a good captain, really. Even if he did give me five days in the break, but he's still a good captain. <laughs> He was a good man, and they just screwed with him, you know. He didn't, they didn't uh, treat him very fair. Mr. Hashimoto also think the Navy tried to put everything on the Mr. McVeigh. That was not right. People don't realize the politics in the armed forces. And uh, he, he was a victim because of someone else fouled up. And who, who, who better be the scapegoat than the captain? Somebody felt like they had to cover his butt. No other ship had a, was lost by, a, by a, a commanding officer was ever court-martialed. What was the precedent to do in this? The question has to be asked, what purpose is served? Once the court-martial occurs, there was no way the court could find him not guilty. So then the question has to be not whether he was in fact guilty, but whether there was any justice served. The court-martial might have been technically correct. It was unjust. You can have a decision that is legally correct and yet unjust. Many a head should have rolled before they ever got to the captain. It was a screw up, Deluxe. I cannot in all honesty try to relive every minute, every hour, every day, every night. Every one of us admit that during the day go by, you don't think about it. If it's not every day and I miss a day or two, there'll be a day or two that I think about it two or three times. Paul lives this story every day, and I can't believe how vivid it is uh, in his mind. A thousand, a thousand times. I drove truck for 44 years, and I sit in the truck stop. I have a cold glass of water. Boom, boom, hits me. It was an incredible tragedy for our family. The guilt is still palpable. Dad said, you know, I spent 30 years trying to forget it and 20 years trying to remember it. And that pretty much summed up what it was like for him. He, he was having a hard time. That's why he went back in the service. See, I could rub that off my mind. But I went home and went to drinking. I drank like a fish for a number of years. I uh, stayed pretty well inebriated. Around that time, my husband, he was drinking lots. My dad was always drinking. My mom and he divorced. They, you know, because it, it affected him a lot. He could never hold out a job. One night, like I was in the ocean, and I woke up sweating. And I remember my dad, he always had liquor there. And I took about two or three drinks of that liquor, and boy, I went back to bed. I, I started drinking after that. Trying to keep the thoughts away or something like that at night. I used to have nightmares a little bit. All of a sudden, he'd just be thrashing and screaming. I wake up screaming and all that. My wife went to hell. Because he makes funny noise, kind of he's afraid. When he was sleeping, he'd be, like, fighting. When it's hard on your husband, it's hard on you. 
He has had many flashbook backs. Uh, there are times, even to this day, when he tells the story, it conjures up great emotion for him. He was very nervous, and we could see that he was under a lot of stress. For a long time after we got married, he didn't talk about much. I think he didn't want to. He tried to forget about all that. You try to forget, but you can't. In Depression years, why? Well, not too many people had anything, and it was a hard life for most people, and uh, we all grew up that way. So it was tough going, and this was tough going while we were in the water. I think most girls and guys in World War II came home with the same attitude. You know, we, we just come out of the Depression, and most people didn't have a hell of a lot, but now these guys come back, and they, they all they want to do is get on with their lives, you know. We didn't ask for anything, and we didn't get anything either. You know. The healing process has, it really occurred several years after the war when he first began to talk about it a little bit. And it's all my story. Yeah. It's like you're the first, you're the first one. I never talked to my wife or my kids for 25 years about this. It was a long time before I could talk about it. Well, I didn't talk about it. You don't talk about stuff like that. I didn't talk about it, you know, just like everybody else. We share many, you know, common feelings because we lost. It's not a hero story, not a great story. We don't talk proudly. I didn't discuss it with my family uh, or anyone. I never hear he talk about this story proudly. My wife and I was married in 1951. The first time I said anything was 58. It was about uh, 30 years after it happened before I would even talk about it, Harley. I didn't speak a word for 27 years about the ship. It was in 1990 that uh, I uh, finally decided to start talking about it. I asked my dad, what ship was it? And he said, Indianapolis. I said, oh, what happened? I was all excited. He, he just looked at me, stared right at me, and he said, it sank. And it was clear he didn't want to talk about it. He didn't talk about it when he came back from the war. He just went ahead and established his life. It's just something that happened that you live with. If I hadn't been after him being a pain in the butt, I wouldn't know anything about it. My kids didn't even know about it until we had our first reunion in 1960. I was there at the first one. The hotel severed. I don't know how many men were there. It seemed like it was about some over 200. Of course, the first reunion is always an emotional meeting. My mother insisted that they go, and I think she knew that it would be therapeutic for him to be able to, sh to just see the other people from the ship. Get rid of me a lot, and get to see your buddies and different things. Say would include rescue crew like us. And I came to a reunion where everybody was hugging and mugging me. I'm the guy that saved them. They treat us like we were angels. A survivor looked Chuck up and told him about the reunion. And they were able to shake the hands of Chuck Gwynn, whose plane spotted them, or they would have never survived, and Mr. Marks. It was just so special to us, because there would be no us if there were no Mr. Gwynn and Mr. Marks. When they got to the reunion, the men were just it was just a marvelous time. The men and the families became best friends. and They sat around, have drinks, and then they'd tell stories. They talked all night at that first reunion. If you would have been able to go to the first reunions, you may be OK, you may have been OK. When they get together, it's healing. They're still healing. Because that was the best therapy, you know, because then they didn't have, like, no post-traumatic stress or go see a shrink and all this here. They did their own therapy by forming that reunion. It's important. It's healing to them. And me. The captain came. He, he dreaded coming on the staff. I can't understand where he got the idea we was against him. I stole the reunion he went to. And we went out to the airport to meet him, and he was greeted with open arms. He was real happy to be there. He was happy about the way the people treated him. Somebody yelled that the captain was aboard, and everybody snapped to and saluted. He said several times, whatever the Navy did to me is OK. You know that however innocent you are, being the captain of a ship that lost 880 men has to weigh heavy on you all your 
you know, all your life. I don't know if you heard about it, but he committed suicide. The hate mail that came from uh, people that lost their loved ones, you know, in the war on the ship, uh, they, uh, they were so full of hate. Josie, sister, she hated McVeigh. They convicted him. She thought he caused it, and that's what the trial did. After the captain was caught martial going, my first thought was, how can we get these guys for doing this? It wasn't just about Captain McVeigh. It really had reflected on all of them. I think it kind of reflected back to the crew and, uh, you know, the whole bunch. When I first met Tony was in uh, Hawaii. We went out to see the submarine decommission. I said, because you never got to um, decommission your ship, I, I would be honored if you would come to Pearl Harbor and join me in the decommissioning of mine. But I'm going to ask you one favor if you do come. I'm going to ask you to stand in formation with my crew. You're going to be part of my crew. And so they did. Almost 30 of them showed up. There was a reception after the ceremony, and um, the survivors were there. So Tody came up, and we had a big meeting. And Paul Murphy came up to me at one point, and he said, you know, I don't know if you've thought about this, but this makes you the last captain of the USS Indianapolis. And I said, yeah, of course I've thought about that. And he said, the last captain of the last Indianapolis needs you. He's, he, he needs your help. And so we, we were all thinking, you being a submarine captain, if anyone could help us clear his name, it would be you. 60 years of trying directly with the Navy, they decided we're gonna try to get our results through other means. We're gonna make it a, his, his exoneration a matter of law. But there's a long way be, be, between entering a bill in Congress and having it actually pass. We made six or eight trips back to Washington, D.C. and walked those halls of Congress pleading our case. I talked to everybody I could, tried my best to get it done. I'd go around and got signatures and everything. As senators, we had big shots down here to do something. Robert Smith. Senator from New Hampshire. He was close enough to power to be able to do something for us. Him and Warner put the bill together. They were in Washington to plead for legislation for one simple reason, to clear their captain's name. They were accompanied by a young boy by the name of Hunter Scott of Pensacola, Florida, whose school history project had led him to join their cause. We finally fought the Navy with the help of this 13-year-old boy, Hunter Scott. We were really getting their attention. Their story, in turn, got my attention. It led me to introduce Senate Joint Resolution 26, which expresses the sense of Congress that Captain McVeigh's court-martial was morally unsustainable. Admiral Pillen, the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, was invited to testify on the matter before the Senate Armed Services Committee. And so since he knew that I knew the story and I had been captain of the submarine in Indianapolis, he said, well, I'm here, this is yours, um, make it right. So that's the way it kind of went down. Um, up until Saturday before the hearings occurred, it was um, September the 11th, 1999, um, Saturday morning, I got a call at home from Admiral Pillen. This is not gonna be good whatever it was. And he told me that he was going to have to change his testimony um, for the hearing and that he was gonna have to toe the line on the court martial. I had to tell the staffers that we were changing our testimony. That, that was kind of a no-brainer. Um, but the, my, my moral dilemma was, do I do more than that? Do I more than merely inform them? I could just send them the testimony and my job is done. Um, and I, I, I decided that I needed to do more than just inform. And he did something for us. Stuck his neck out pretty far. And so what I did was I sent them the testimony, but I also sent them my murder board questions, the questions that I knew we had no answers for. One question they declined to answer. Would he have been court-martialed if he had arrived safely in the Philippines, but had failed to zigzag that night? The answer quite obviously is no, and the Navy's argument simply defies logic. Senator Smith, he really, he finally got the Navy to say it was a bad call. And, and as a result, 
you know, one could argue that I worked against my own boss, but I prefer to think I worked in favor of history because this was done to right a wrong. And in fact, um, when the Navy changed its testimony, Senator Warner got mad. He couldn't understand why the Navy couldn't throw the survivors a bone and, and just admit that maybe justice wasn't served. And the Navy's unwillingness to even do that, as little as it is, is what caused him to get mad enough to allow the measure to go to the full Senate for a vote, where it passed, became law, was signed into law by President Clinton. We now have the opportunity to give the remaining survivors of this terrible tragedy what they deserve and have fought so hard for, so tenaciously for, for so long. We finally got our captain exonerated. The USS Indianapolis has earned its place in the annals of American and world history. For 60 years I cried. I cried a lot. And now I ain't gonna cry anymore. Indianapolis changed history. It was a ship that changed history, but the men paid the price. Um, it was President Roosevelt's ship that stayed before the war. Worst disaster I'd seen in our Navy's history. 10 battles, just so many things tied to this story to make it special. 109 is a boat, and in the Indianapolis is hull number 35, but it's the story of the men that makes the story. I've said so many times, if somebody wrote this up as fiction, nobody would believe it happened. It's really a fascinating story from, from start, start to finish, where they delivered the bomb and... Uh... Then you have the sinking story. Then you have the five days in the water story. Then you have the miraculous rescue story. Then you have the court martial story. Then you have the years of suffering story and to the exoneration story. And again, it's just there's so much that you cannot believe that it actually happened, but it did. You know, eventually, they're not going to be here anymore, and we just need to... We need to keep the story alive. The greatest gift we all can do, just raise awareness, especially when this event, the Indianapolis sinking, is not even in most of the history books. Public in general knew too much about this ship until Jaws was made. When I first started talking about it, it was uh, right after Jaws came out. And then people found that there was a big story here. Such an important thing uh, for people to know about it, that this, this can happen and did happen. And then that's when you realize, would you or would you not have made it? Many people, especially our younger generation, don't recognize the fact that freedom is not free. In fact, Dad says in many places that he goes to speak, they don't even know much about World War II, much less the Indianapolis. We, we need to know what is uh, history. We need to know what uh, many people try to hide something bad things, but uh, we should know the reality. Let's get this story out because people need to understand uh, the dynamics of, of evil and the issues of war and freedom. People know how fortunate we are that we won this war. That was the most important war that we ever fought, I think, because if uh, Hitler or, or Japan would have won, where would we be today, you know? It isn't that they're looking for a medal, but I think recognition and for the younger generation coming on to understand the price of freedom. There were many, many men that worked so hard during the war, and the real heroes are the ones that didn't come home. I mean, it was the greatest generation. Uh, these were ordinary men in an extraordinary time. This group of Americans set the pattern of uh, how proud we are of our country and how we'll fight for it and carry that on, continue. Now, I was aboard that ship almost four years. I earned the 10 battle stars, and I'm going to go back and join my ship. And that's my story. It's the story that's not been told. So you see that now. And there's no one speaking. Those uh, don't want to remember. They don't want to recall this. It's too much. But I'm a dummy. I think it ought to be told.
Black and- 